Okay, so um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Sorry, my lighting's scary, but um, my name is Stephanie Kelb. I'm the um, program director at uh, Northwestern in Chicago. Um, and we're gonna be talking about um, your dynamics and we're gonna do some cases and I will try to get to as many cases as we can. I'm not sure what was in the neuro um, lecture from yesterday, um, but um, hopefully they talked a little bit about um, your dynamics. So just the objectives of what we're gonna do today, we're gonna talk about just the basic components of your dynamics. So, um, and I think it's important to remember, you can get a lot of good information without putting a catheter in someone's bladder. Um, and so the reflex often in certain situations, well, let's get your dynamics. And um, sometimes it's generally, it's not necessary and or it's not helpful um, sort of thing. And I, I apologize, it's the only COVID imaging I will show. Um, and then how do you get the best information out of your dynamics? When are they indicated? When are they not indicated? And we'll do some cases. But I'm gonna start kind of with the basics of, of what your dynamics are um, and what the components are because you say your dynamics, sometimes people don't really know the, the true components of it and what you can and can't get from it. Here's Chicago in a better weather than what we're having right now. Um, so it's important to remember you can get a lot of information about um, patients' bladders from um, simple non-invasive measures of bladder function. So things like a frequency volume chart. You know, someone comes into your clinic and says, gosh, you know, I, I pee a lot. Well, what does that even mean? Um, and what's abnormal and what's normal? Um, and that's, that's a good question, right? Because if you, you know, drink three pots of coffee a day, you're gonna be peeing all the time. Does that mean there's something wrong with your bladder? And the answer is no, there's something wrong with how much, how much coffee you're drinking. Um, so you can get a lot of good information from just a frequency volume chart, which just has the patient measure how much they're going and how often they're going and what their voiding interval is. It also allows you to evaluate their urine production for 24 hours. Um, other things that if you wanna get a little more detailed, you can do what's called a bladder diary where you can assess symptoms as well. Um, and so um, that tells you whether they have an urge, whether, they, whether the leakage happened, if there's leakage, when there's stress. You record their fluid intake, um, and you really want three days of, of recordings to help you um, figure out like what's an average day. Um, there's also a non-invasive euro flow you can do. I'm not gonna talk specifically about euro cuffs, so that's another thing that's available. Um, and then post void residual, right, with an ultrasound, or you can, if you don't have a fancy little ultrasound, you can just use straight catheterization for that. And this is just an example of kind of what a typical bladder diary will look like. Um, sometimes it'll, people will come in with pages and pages of things. Um, I find that accountants and engineers will bring you an Excel sheet from the last two months of their life, um, which may be a little bit of an overkill. Um, so this is a lot of helpful information, and actually studies have shown that patient symptoms improve just by having them record objectively what they're doing, uh, what, they're, what their avoiding patterns are like. Um, so they may say, oh, I pee all the time, and they look at it, and it's not so bad as what they thought, or um, so they, they get better. So the good thing about bladder diaries, they're cheap, they're not invasive, um, they can give you lots of useful information. You give them this little hat for the toilet, it has little measuring bars on it. The problems is, are with them is that, you know, the patients sometimes fill them out on the way to the appointment. So they're not always reliable. Um, and obviously, if you've got a patient with, say, some cognitive issues, dementia, even, even some mild cognitive issues may have trouble uh, filling this sort of thing out. Um, measuring it is inconvenient. Patients are like, well, I don't want to take that to work. Well, most of the time, well, not in this day and age, but most of the time people are at work uh, during the day more than they're home. Um, so it's difficult to take that with you to the office. So if you look at the, you know, on the AUA um, website, there are guidelines for your dynamics. Um, and so these are kind of the general uh, in for, uh, guidelines for when do you do your, your dynamics. Um, and, um, you know, it's really important, certainly, and I know you had the neurogenic bladder uh, lecture uh, yesterday um, for the neurogenic population and certain neurogenics, which I'm sure they went over um, yesterday, certain neurogenic bladder patients need this and certain patients actually don't. Um, so these are kind of the, the general indications, Oops. but the bumper tracks is what we're worried about. The other thing you have to remember when you do your dynamics is that you need to have a specific question that you're trying to answer. Um, and so just doing your dynamics because someone's there um, and has a specific diagnosis isn't, isn't the right thing to do necessarily. And you want to make sure in the dynamics that their symptoms are actually reproduced. Um, however, you know, if you think about it, when you do your dynamics, you have a patient sitting with catheters in them, they're sitting on a little stage, there's at least one other person in the room, typically, oftentimes two, 
Um, sometimes there's x-ray involved. Um, and so um, it may be hard for the patients to reproduce their symptoms. And certainly, uh, you know, it's hard for people to pee um, in that situation. So just because, and I can't tell you how many referrals I've gotten for retention of urine for patients that really don't have retention, that they just couldn't pee um, during the urodynamics study, which, you know, I think is more normal than abnormal, honestly. Um, it is an interactive evaluation. So if you look at a tracing, um, it's difficult to know what was going on unless it's well marked by the nurse or assistant who's doing the urodynamics with you. Um, so you can't just look at it and go, okay, like when you see a bladder contraction, well, did that patient try to go or was that an uninhibited one? And you don't know that unless um, you have someone in there uh, paying attention to what's going on. This is kind of general categories. I'm not going to talk about pediatric urodynamics because there's too much math and calculation involved, but I'm just kidding. Um, but these are kind of the general indications of when you'd want to do um, urodynamics. If it's going to help you make a decision, um, then it makes sense to do that um, for the patient. So I typically do that when I can't figure out what's going on, um, when I think I know but I'm not sure, and I'm planning some sort of procedural intervention. So if someone has mixed incontinence, and you're leaning towards, oh, they have more urge than stress, for instance, um, giving them a medicine, you don't have to do a urodynamics for that to try out and see if it's gonna work. If that doesn't work and you're still not sure, then and you, maybe it makes sense to do it in those patients. And when I'm trying to decide between treatment options, many women have mixed incontinence, and so um, trying to figure out which is worse, which is the bigger problem, um, and then how bad the stress is, because certainly, you know, what I find is that patients, women with mixed incontinence, if they have bad, bad stress incontinence, no matter what you do to help their bladder, um, you're still going to have, they're still going to have urgency, they're gonna, still going to have leakage from the stress, um, and they're not going to be able to tell an improvement. Certainly for monitoring neurogenic bladder patients. And the other thing to think about um, is changes in, in the neurogenic, neurogenic bladders, uh, neurogenic patients' bladder symptoms. So if you have a patient who's been dry for the last 10 years, spinal cord patient, catheterizing no problems, and all of a sudden they start leaking or having infections, you've got to look for a source, and sometimes it can be um, a change in their bladder. And there's a variety of things that can do that. Uh, syringe, uh, uh, you can have syrinxes of the cord. I had one patient whose actual uh, rods that were um, placed, one of the screws broke out, uh, broke off, and was actually impinging on his cord. His bladder just went crazy after being completely stable for about 10 years. So what are our components of, of your dynamics? So there's non-invasive pressure flow measurement. You can, uh, we'll talk about pressure flows in a little, uh, non-invasive flow measurement, sorry. There's post-void residual, like we talked about, either um, we typically do it at the start of the procedure after they come into the room, they pee, and then you drain their bladder and see what's left. Um, there are CMG, which is measures the storage phase of the bladder, and then the pressure flow study, which measures emptying. So there's, there's really two main functions of the bladder, storage and emptying, and those are the two things you're gonna evaluate um, with the urodynamics. You also have do EM, we do EMG, surface electrodes typically. Needle electrodes are, um, as you can imagine, a needle in your perineum or multiple needles in your perineum trying to evaluate your pelvic floor and the external sphincter are not uh, comfortable, often used in, um, for research purposes or in patients that are not sensate particularly, we don't use these. And fluoroscopy may or may not be required, required depending on the patient. You know, we have it. It's, it's sometimes a nice adjunct if you don't get the, the answer you wanted or say the, the actual urodynamics catheter slides out and you've lost your pressure measures. Sometimes the imaging can tell you a, a, a good amount about what's going on. So what's a Euroflow? Well, it's pretty simple. The patient pees into something that measures their flow. And there's different ways that, the, um, that can be measured uh, by weight is one of the common ways. Um, is expressed in milliliters per second. Um, and the patient should avoid at least 150 milliliters for it to be valid. And so um, why is that? Well, if you only pee about 50, your flow initially, is gonna, your flow initially might be kind of slow um, and you may not uh, be capturing the true flow. The other thing is you have to um, take this with a grain of salt. We know if you let patients do um, come in like sequentially and do multiple Euro flows, they actually get better at it. Um, and it's also difficult sometimes for women, it can be very inaccurate because when women void, particularly an older patient where the urethra is retracted kind of inside, um, the urine may be trickling down their labia, down the side of their leg, and obviously you're not getting um, a true flow. And then if you want to do uh, a more detailed, right, you put, you have catheters in, and that's the pressure flow part of the procedure where you measure the pressure um, with the flow, against the flow. 
Um, and you want to know, is this representative of what normal, normally is going on? And, and those, like I said, those things we talked about may make it not uh, completely valid. And so these are nice um, schematic pictures. This is flow versus time. Um, and you should see a nice uh, uh, a peak uh, and then a down flow as opposed to a flatter flow, uh, which uh, looks more like uh, possibly an obstructed picture. It could be also from a hypocontractile obtruser. So when you're evaluating flow, you should kind of know what the normal ranges are. Um, um, so um, for, for men, um, they do decline with age. So that's important to remember. Um, why is that? Well, because of the prostate um, and also in, in patients, the, the bladder muscle, and I explain this to people, all of our muscles unfortunately get weaker with time and the bladder is, is no exception to that necessarily. Um, for women, women's uroflows are interesting because if you think about it, the resistance to flow in a tube is determined by, if you remember your physics days, um, determined by the length of the tube and the diameter of the tube, among other things. Um, so men have a much longer urethra, women have a very short urethra, three to four centimeters. Um, and some women can actually avoid by a nearly imperceptible detrusor contraction with urethral relaxation because the, out, the outlet resistance is so much lower. Um, and it really doesn't actually vary all that much by age. So, um, so let's talk about um, patient preparation, right? So this is a thing no one talks about, but it's pretty important if you wanna get um, the study done properly. Um, so when you tell a patient, you're gonna have them come back for your dynamics, or hey, let's go do your dynamics, um, you really need to explain what's gonna happen. And you know, we have handouts for the patients to explain it before they come in. Um, so they're there, because you start telling people you're gonna put things into their urethra and their rectum, it freaks out most people. Um, and you know, it's pretty important to reassure them it's not a painful test. It's a very quick test, actually, the actual test part of it, um, the setup um, and everything takes longer, especially with neurogenics and things. Uh, we ask them to arrive with a full bladder, but um, if you can imagine that someone has a lot of urgency frequency and they're doing this, um, they may show up at the hospital and have to pee and there's not a whole lot you can do about that. But it's nice to have them um, void when they first get there to do an initial Euroflow. Why? Because that Euroflow is probably going to be a little better than the one with the catheter in. Not always, but it can be. And then you can measure their residual urine after they go. So when you place the catheter, the first thing we do is drain the bladder and measure what the, the, the um, residual urine is. Um, this recommendation is here to, make a, to have patients make a, do a BM, uh, have a bowel movement prior to the study. I don't know how you make someone do that, but it's what's recommended. Um, just because you're putting, you know, a, a catheter in there. Um, and you want the urodynamic room to be kind of quiet. You want it to be private. You know, we have um, curtains in all the rooms. We want there to be minimal traffic. Um, and uh, for women, if they have prolapse, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, um, you do want to reduce their prolapse, uh, and we'll talk about why that is um, in a minute. So, um, oh, and you have to give them a nice hat to wear and a gown. No, I'm kidding. Um, all right, so this is kind of what the setup, setup looks like. This is the schematic. Um, and so if you think about it, um, in the old days, um, the way this was done, there used to be not a fancy um, uh, transducer, pressure transducers and pumps. Um, really, it was gravity and a water manometer um, were how you measured pressures. And this is why we measure in centimeters of water um, as far as pressure is concerned. Um, but, um, but nowadays we have um, the catheters have, um, the, the uh, bladder catheter has a um, pressure transducer on it, and typically it can have two, depending on what you're what you're looking for. Um, and so P vest just measures the total pressure within that bladder. So that's what P vest is, pressure vesicle, right? Um, and you can also have a little transducer, a pressure sensor here, which we typically do, which measures urethral uh, sphincter pressure. Um, to get that in the right place, you certainly don't have to have fluoro. You can do. Um, you can use the, you can just pull the, the catheter in and out until you get the highest um, uh, pressure measurement. And that's, you know, typically where the external sphincter is. And then you just tape the catheter in place. Um, there's also a rectal uh, catheter that has a pressure transducer in it. Um, and we're gonna, and that's what um, uh, is measured here. So if you wanna really know what's going on with a detrusor, PDET means detrusor. And the way I think about PDET is the muscle is what's the bladder actually doing in all of this? So if you measure the pressure here and the patient has a cough, both of these pressures are going to go up. So what you're going to do is you're going to subtract out the, re oops, sorry about that, the rectal pressure 
um, to give you what's really going on with the bladder. So is the bladder contracting or not? Is that pressure change um, real or not? Um, things you have to, there's a lot of troubleshooting that goes on with um, your dynamics. So say you're doing the, the procedure and the rectal catheter slides out um, and it's gonna throw, the, the pressure is way out of whack and you have to recognize that maybe the, the P-DET isn't what I need to look at and I need to look at the P-Vesicle. Um, and that does happen sometimes. Okay, so what do we learn in your dynamics? Um, so there's five C's. So the capacity, and you, you kind of get a lot of sensory information, particularly if um, this is a sensate patient. Um, obviously, sometimes with the neurogenics that are incomplete, you can certainly get sensory information as well. Uh, what's their compliance? So the compliance is a key component, and I focus on this a lot in the neurogenic population. And that's just a measure of how stretchy is the bladder, how compliant is the bladder, how low is that pressure in there as it fills up, um, to keep your kidneys happy. Um, and that's just a simple calculation. And that's at end fill capacity, so at capacity or before an, an, the, uh, an uninhibited contraction. So you don't want to measure the compliance when the bladder is having contraction. It's going to be before that happens. Uh, what about the contractility? So as it's filling, do you have uninhibited contractions? Is it unstable? Um, and then it, during the voiding phase, um, is there bladder outlet obstruction? Um, is the bladder working really hard to get the urine and there's very poor flow? Or is the bladder not working very hard and it's, it's, it's hypocontractile and you have poor flow because your bladder's wimpy? Um, there's a big difference between those two things. Uh, the complete list, completeness, so we're going to get the post blood residual. And then communication, particularly for the neuro population, are the sphincters, the internal and external sphincter, though mainly we focus on the external sphincter, um, are they synergic or dyssynergic? And I would assume in the neurogenic uh, talk that you had some uh, discussions about this, but mainly for patients with things that affect their cord, their suprasacral cord, those are the patients we're worried about for dyssynergia. People that have cortical issues, if you think about, right, the pontine micturition center is below the level of cortex. So cortical issues like strokes, um, dementia, um, brain tumors um, will not necessarily will not cause dyssynergia. Um, they might cause overactivity, they might cause uh, un you to have unhealthy contractions, um, but they're not going to cause the sphincter and the bladder to be dyssynergic. They're going to work together. Okay, so I think that one of the things that um, Dr. Ween um, brought to urology uh, was simplifying your dynamics for all of us that are um, um, are, are, are like doing ways that are simple and, and whose brains can understand this. So when you, when you first look at tracing, sometimes you're like, what is going on? So you really want to think about it. The, the bladder has two phases, right? It has a storage phase and an emptying phase. And so you can have problems that can occur with either storage or emptying, and they can be caused by either the bladder or the outlet or both. So for example, you have a patient who has an uninhibited detrusor contraction and they leak. So what do they have? Well, they have a failure to store, right? Um, you know at the end of the study, say they pee okay, so you don't have a, a failure to empty. And why are they not storing? Well, it's because their bladder is having uninhibited contractions. Contrast that to women that leak when they cough and strain, um, their bladder fills up fine, the pressures are nice and low, and then when they cough, the urine leaks out. So there's no storage problem there. There's a, a storage problem there, but it's not related to the bladder. Um, it's related to the outlet. All right, so um, why is this so important? Why is storage pressures important? Why are they important? Well, because the bladder um, can have uh, problems with, um, with storage pressures, and when that happens, um, there can be issues with um, the kidneys. And so the bladder has two phases, storage and emptying, has to store at a nice low pressure. Um, it is um, a um, controlled um, void, so you wanna have uh, control over when you uh, empty the bladder and you want that to be voluntary. Um, and when neurologic issues happen, all, all or any of those phases can be affected. So like I was saying, um, the, the storage phase is important for the kidneys. Um, mostly this is passive, so um, the stretchy bladder is because it's elastic properties and viscoelastic properties. Um, however, when neurologic um, injuries happen, sometimes the bladder becomes thickened and stiff and does not store at low pressure and then you don't have Mr. Happy Kidney here like we were saying. All right, so we're gonna start with our first poll question, and let's talk about what urodynamics findings put your upper tracts at risk. So um, Christy, if you can 
All right, so there could be more than one correct answer. So what are you worried about upper tract deterioration? Reflux, high pressure to tissue contractions during filling, high compliance, low storage pressures, or a high valsalva leak point pressure? I'll give everybody about 30 seconds and then we'll, we'll kind of go over the, the answers one at, one at a time. Okay, um, so many of you think, um, so 71% said vesicle ureteral reflux. Um, and then the next best answer was 85% 85, 85 said high pressure to truce your contractions during filling. So um, the answer is, is two, right? High compliance and low storage pressures is the same thing. So that's good. We want a highly compliant bladder with low storage pressures. Um, vesicle ureteral reflux is, is interesting because if you look at the studies in pediatric vesicle ureteral reflux, reflux itself um, does not cause upper tract deterioration. Actually, reflux with infections can cause upper tract deterioration and scarring of the kidneys, but reflux of itself, um, not necessarily. And if you look at patients, um, particularly on, on our adult side, if I have a patient who has uh, reflux and um, dilated upper tracts from a bad bladder and I augment that bladder, I typically don't reimplant their ureters and actually their um, renal function stabilizes. Um, and the reflux, the dilation may not go away, um, but it, in and of itself, it isn't necessarily damaging to the kidneys. And a high valsalva leak point pressure is, is kind of what we all have or we, sh we should have if we don't leak. So a high leak point pressure is you cough and it takes a whole lot of pressure for the, for the urine to come out. Um, that's not necessarily going to hurt your kidneys. Now, that was a trick, of course, because we're talking, if you talk about detrusor leak point pressure, um, a high detrusor leak point pressure can be problematic in the neurogenic population. All right, we can close that question. I like that one. Okay. So, um, as we were saying, so impaired, poor compliance. Um, detrusor external sphincter dyssynergic can do it. So, if a patient's trying to avoid and the outlet is staying closed, that pressure is be tr being transmitted to your kidneys. Um, detrusor internal sphincter dyssynergia, similarly the same thing. High pressure detrusor um, overactivity through filling and elevated detrusor leak point pressure. And the famous study by Dr. McGuire back many, many years ago looking at um, a group of spina bifida patients showed that if their um, detrusor leak point pressure was above 40, they were, higher at risk, high, were at higher risk for upper tract uh, damage and poor emptying with high storage pressures. So if you think about it, why is this? Well, kidneys, and I explained to patients, the kidneys just kind of drip urine down into the bladder. They don't have any way to push it down with any force, right? So your, your GFR is determined um, partially by your filtration pressure. Um, and so if the back pressure is high, even without reflux, you can have a uh, lot scarring of the kidneys over time. So yes, the, the pelvis peristalsis and yes, the ureter peristalsis, but they're tiny little wimpy muscles um, and we wanna, um, they won't necessarily, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the time. Um, they won't, um, it won't be able to deliver the urine at an efficient manner. Okay, so we'll talk about the storage stage a little more. How is this done, right? It's, it's important to know this and I would encourage all of you that are in training um, to spend some time in the urodynamic suite, even if it's you know, not required to, to be there. I mean, I have my residents go there and stay there uh, with, with our nurse to really learn how to troubleshoot and learn what's done uh, during the study. So you don't want too small of a catheter, we zero it to atmosphere, um, and we fill with uh, hopefully um, some sort of physiologic fluid. We can use contrast, um, sterile water, saline. We'd like it close to body temperature, um, though it ends up mostly being room temperature uh, for people. And then you gotta look at the fill rate. If you uh, look at the fill rate, depending on what you're doing the study for. So if you've got a, a neurogenic patient, filling at 50 to 60 ml per minute may end up showing a whole bunch of unanimous contractions that may not be the reality for that patient. So um, oftentimes if, if you start filling and the patient starts having unanimity contractions right away, um, I'll just stop and slow the fill down. Um, and you can go less than 10 millimeter, milliliters per minute if you needed to. Obviously it depends on how much time you have, um, but a slow fill is very important for the neurogenic patient. Contrast that to some patient that you have that maybe came into the ER, into the emergency room with two liters in his bladder from outlet obstruction you probably don't want to fill that person to 10 ml per minute when you do evaluate for outlet obstruction and for contractility because you're going to be there all day. 
So the storage phase, the capacity, um, so how much does the, the sort of the functional capacity, I call it, when does the patient feel full, their sensation, the compliance, and the contractility, that is, are they having uninhibited contractions or not. Um, when, what's normal? Well, this is kind of a range, and if you um, uh, look at uh, studies, they'll give you a range for when patients first feel it, when their first desire is, and when their strong desire is. And really, it, this can be pretty variable. You really want to um, have the patients let you know when they really, you know, feel like they have a strong urge to avoid and they really can't hold it much longer. I mean, that's kind of their capacity um, um, situation. So what's a normal compliance? Again, this is measured by changing volume over changing pressure. Oh, sorry, I forgot to change the CCs to MLs here, but same thing. Um, so you want a highly compliant bladder. You want to be able to get to a large volume at a low pressure. Um, and you don't want there to be unstable contractions during the filling. Again, going back to how you measure this, so we're talking about measuring what's happening with the detrusor um, pressures. Okay, so here's a, a picture of a, of, a, of a urodynamics tracing, and we're just kind of going to go through this. So up here is the flow. This is measuring the patient's um, uh, urine output. This is filling, though this isn't entirely accurate here. This is the abdominal pressure. This is the, um, the vesicle pressure. And then like we said, this minus this equals your detrusor pressure. So this is really what's happening in the bladder, um, leaving out whatever's happening in the abdomen. So if you look at this particular tracing, um, and you see this little mark right here, well, you see there's a, some flow here and here. And why is that? Well, why is it? If you follow this tracing along, right, we can look at this patient, and I don't have volumes on here, I apologize, but this looks like a normally compliant bladder. And let's say this is, I don't know, 400 ml, so we'd say, that, say their capacity is normal. Here, what happened? Well, there were increases in abdominal pressure, and if we didn't mark it, we don't know what it is, but either the patient coughed or they were asked to cough or strain, and you typically see these spikes, quick spikes like that of pressure. So you know that this leak, this leak here, is from abdominal pressure and not from your, from your what's happening in your detrusor muscle. So that's by definition stress incontinence. And then we get to here and let the patient probably is given permission to avoid about here. And the patient tries to go a little bit, which, you know, like I said, this is typical. You're not going to see this great, beautiful curve every time someone pees because it's difficult for patients to pee on a stage. Um, but this could be or could not be a normal uh, avoiding pressure. The flow here is about 12, which means here it's about 15. So this may be, depending on what the situation is, a fairly unobstructed normal study. You might say this is a little high, um, but it actually looks, looks not terrible, maybe 80. So it's a little on the high side with these spikes, but sometimes you get this, these artifacts in here um, that make it a little hard to see. So this is probably a stress incontinence patient. Um, with a fairly normal uh, flow. It was probably, could be a man um, post prostatectomy or something. Of course, that never happens. But. Okay, so what can we see also during the filling phase? Detrusor overactivity um, with uninhibited contractions. Um, and just to remember, 40% of patients who have urge urinary incontinence, if you do your dynamics on them, you may not see detrusor overactivity. Um, there used to be a minimum of, of 15. Um, uh, centimeters of water pressure increase for a detrusor uh, contraction to be determined. Um, now, basically, we say if there's a minimal amplitude change and the patient feels an urge, we consider that um, detrusor overactivity. So this is the kind of picture that you see, and you know this because, say, you were there in the study, um, the patient was not given permission to go, but they had, they felt, they felt an urge here. Um, and we know, so this is, um, this is the um, vesicle pressure, abdominal pressure, detrusor pressure, you see the abdominal pressure is not going up. So this is what your bladder, what your detrusor is doing. And it happens again here. So these are multiple uninhibited contractions. And you can see there's little bits of leak if you see the flow here and flow here. I can tell you with little volume leakage, it's really hard to measure that. It's more um, by sensation or visually you're in the room because um, for that to trickle down and make it to the, the um, where you're measuring the flow is difficult. There's a couple of different leak point pressures we talked about, um, and I will just leave this here, um, but there's a difference between a valsalva and a detrusor leak point pressure. Detrusor leak point pressures are really in the absence of an actual contraction. So this is a poorly compliant bladder. As the pressure goes up, at what point do they leak? So you can have a terrible bladder, and if you have a terrible outlet, and you're leaking all the time, your kidneys aren't gonna be hurt by that. So that's why a, um, a high detrusor leak point pressure can be problematic, because if your pressure goes up and it takes a lot for you to leak, those kidneys are seeing that pressure. Okay, poll question number two. 
All right, this is a 41 year old woman, G3P3. She has urgency frequency. She leaks when she stands and with urge. She wants this fix. She's sped up, she's done with it. So which of the following is not required prior to proceeding with surgery? A pelvic exam, a cough stress test, a post void residual, urodynamics with pressure flow evaluation, discussion of non -mesh, that non-mesh alternatives are available, or a negative COVID test. Sorry, I did have to put a COVID thing in there. This may be our new normal. We'll give you 30 seconds for that and I'll shut up. Okay, so which is not required? That's correct. So absolutely that um, your dynamics are, are not necessarily required uh, prior to intervention. If you have a positive cough stress test in the office, um, that's all you really need. Now, if you're really worried about her overactive bladder symptoms, um, you could do your dynamics, but it's certainly not required. And you absolutely have to discuss um, that non meshal options are available um, and um, the negative COVID test will depend on your institution. So. Um, okay, we can go on to the next. Oh, I guess I can close it. There we go. All right. So, so this is kind of what stress incontinence looks like on a urodynamics. We'll not belabor this again. We kind of went over this. So, um, why do we know that we don't need um, a urodynamics? We used to do a lot of urodynamics on women with stress incontinence, and as it turns out, um, you don't really need it. It doesn't help you um, to determine. Um, it doesn't help you. Um, any more than a positive cop stress test in the office. Um, and I'll just kind of move on to this because I know you want to do some, some cases. Um, what's the pressure flow study part of your dynamics? So really that's the voiding phase. Um, and so typically in a sensate patient, when a patient feels a strong urge to go, you give them permission to void um, and you let them void. Um, and so um, <clears throat> it's, um, uh, you don't necessarily need um, fluoro for this, but sometimes it can help you. Um, usually we use nomograms, um, but nomograms for men, this is sort of pressure versus flow. Um, pressure versus flow is a good way to evaluate um, for obstruction. Um, but for women, as we said, their outlets are very different um, uh, during, uh, because of their uh, short urethra. You can use whichever nomogram you want. If you have a urodynamics machine, which most of us do, it actually spits out this little graph here which is um, now called the International, International Consonant Society nomogram, which basically plots um, the maximal flow versus the pressure at, Q, at Qmax. So, um, and that's, um, that's the best measure of obstruction for patients. And there's one for women, and speaking of obstruction, here's Chicago in the winter time. Okay, um, what about prolapse? So what, why do we do, why do we reduce the prolapse in women if we're gonna do your dynamics? Well, we're going to want to evaluate for occult stress incontinence. And we know that when your bladder is hanging down, which a lot of prolapse is anterior dominant, anterior and apical, the urethra is kind of kinked um, and it masks underlying incontinence as they otherwise would have. So if you um, reduce the prolapse in patients that are uh, continent uh, by history, you may unmask that. Um, and um, this can help you um, decide whether or not you want to do an anti-incontinence procedure. And there's debate in the female pelvic medicine world. Some people do a sling on everyone, then they do a prolapse repair on. Um, I go by either history or a, a reduced cough stress test. Um, okay, so we're going to go to some cases now. Let me see how much time we have left. Where am I at? Okay, I think I have about 10 more minutes, so that's good. Um, and then we'll stop for questions. Um, all right, so this is a 60-year-old man with um, bilateral hernia repair uncomplicated surgery, a difficulty voiding postoperatively, goes home with a catheter. He fails a voiding trial two days later. Um, he does not have any voiding symptoms. Um, your partner or one of the PAs in your office schedule him with you for a urodynamics uh, four days later to figure out what's going on. The question becomes, do you perceive, and this is not a poll question, um, but what's the answer to this? Um, typically, no, right? Post-op retention, there's risk factors for this. Um, men with bilateral hernias actually are at a pretty high risk. Um, I think about 30% of them, 15 to 30% can have retention afterwards. Um, so think risk, risk factors for post-op retention, any of you that have done consults on urology and gotten called by ortho and neurosurgery repeatedly, um, immobility, spine or pelvic surgery, narcotic use, constipation, 
and age. So the question is, if you're gonna do your dynamics in that patient, you know, I mean, not the question is, but if you're gonna do your dynamics in that patient, what is the question, right? The patient can't pee, you know the patient can't pee, put a catheter in them, fill them up with the aerodynamics machine, they're still not gonna be able to pee, so it doesn't really help you. Now, if this drags on or the patient has pre-existing symptoms and it hasn't resolved in a certain amount of time, um, then you may wanna do it because maybe the patient does need an outlet procedure. Um, men, no offense, sometimes to ignore their symptoms. So um, maybe the patient is pretty clinically obstructed and the, the procedure tipped them over the edge, but most of the time this patient just needs to come back in a week for another voiding trial once they're more ambulatory and off their pain meds, and that may resolve. Okay, so we're gonna do another case. This is a 64-year-old woman with mixed incontinence. She leaks with cough, sneeze, and movement. She leaks with urge, she leaks at night. She's miserable. And to throw you a little monkey around, she's also had a um, history of radiation with cervical cancer. Um, and I don't know if you guys probably have managed cervical cancer radiation patients. They get very high dose radiation. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, the cervix being right there by your bladder and your ureters, um, this can cause some real problems uh, later on. All right, so here's our urodynamics. Um, so let's just orient what we're doing. The top line is the vesicle pressure. The second line is the abdominal pressure. The third line is um, the detrusor pressure, so what's happening in the bladder. The fourth line is our EMG. The fifth line is the flow. Um, and then the urethral pressure is down here. We did put a urethral, uh, a catheter with the urethral pressure in it. So you can see you start filling, and all of a sudden her pressure starts going up. Now, why does it dip here? Well, it dips here because there's a little bit of, there's some artifact going on in the the abdominal pressure went up for some reason. It didn't register on the vesicle pressure, so it subtracted it out from your detrusor pressure. So it's not like her bladder when it's negative pressure. So you'll see these things. You see it again here. Um, you have to look at the overall study to really um, interpret it. But from my mind, she's got this pressure is going up. So let's talk about what's her compliance. Um, this has, I think this is about 50 milliliters, and she's already increased her pressure. This was from zero to 100 to at least 20, um, if not more. Um, and it kind of stays like that, it goes up some more here, but we only get her to about 100 milliliters. And then here, at a, at a pretty low volume, we have her cough. Um, and what happens, um, she does get a leak here, and it's, you can see it on the blip there, but there was a leak here. So you can see it's marked too by leak. Like I said, with women, it's hard to, to measure that on the tracing, to have it show up on the tracing, even though it happened. And then we got her to about 100 or mLs or so, and then she just couldn't really hold it anymore. And the, actually the urine, this is, this is some artifacts she was moving around, but it did just start leaking out eventually at about 100 ml. So, um, so what's her problem? Failure to store, failure to empty. Let's think about it for a second. So failure to store, I would say yes. Why? Well, one, she has stress incontinence. So it's a failure to store because of her outlet. And she has failure to store because her bladder compliance is not good. So, Failure to store, yes, from the bladder and the outlet. Failure to empty, um, she does not necessarily retain urine here. Um, so let's say she empties completely, right? So failure to store, do the bladder and the outlet. Failure to empty, no. Um, and add to that, she also has hematuria and recurrent pyelonephritis. So what are you gonna do for this patient? Let's think about it. You fix her outlet. Um, if you fix her bladder with meds, maybe, right, maybe you can help that compliance. So we know that medications don't help compliance very much. Now, why is her compliance bad? She doesn't have a neurologic issue. Um, but as you, anyone that's, again, taking neurology calls know, knows bladders um, can really become fibrotic from radiation. They can be very stiff, um, poorly pliable. She has a very small capacity. If you fix her outlet, say you, you decided her tissue was good enough and you could put a sling in her, and we certainly wouldn't want to use mesh in this radiated patient, um, we want to do a fascial sling for her. If you do that, you're gonna ruin her kidneys pretty fast. Um, and her tissue is so bad and her bladder is so small, um, she opts to go with this cystectomy conduit. She's actually on our um, waiting for surgery list right now, um, but thankfully um, she's stabilized her, um, her bleeding. She's been admitted multiple times needing transfusion, so, She's been good for a while, but if she comes in again um, needing transfusions, um, she may end up just getting her surgery done. Okay, next patient, 22-year-old with spina bifida. She has urinary incontinence despite intermittent catheterization, and she takes total teratine. She leaks day and night. She thinks maybe it's worse with activity. Um, she doesn't have a recent evaluation. She moved to Chicago five years ago. 
um, hasn't really established with anyone, um, is too old to go to the children's hospital, they don't want her. So let's look at this tracing. Um, so this is kind of what her bladder looks like. This is the, the video part, actually this is probably at her sphincter there. So again, um, this is, and it's hard to read the, the subheadings here, but again, this is the same order vesicle abdominal detrusor. <clears throat> and here she's filling up. And these little marks here, the purple arrows are, she leaked with cough. Um, so she's leaking here with, um, with little bits of increase in abdominal pressure. Um, and this big purple arrow, she starts just pouring out urine uh, pouring out the, the inflow at the same rate as it goes in. And this is actually not at 392 volume, so this is at like um, 100, 100 cc's volume. So the urine is just kind of, the fluid that you're putting in is leaking back out. So what are we going to do with this? We didn't get much in. She's very frustrated. She wants to be dry. <clears throat> she's super wet. So she's continuously leaked with further fill without any further rise in pressure. So what's our next step? Um, this is poll question three. Okay, next step is continue her urodynamics, put a, a proline, uh, put a mesh sling in her, do an autologous sling for her, do a bladder augment and a sling. Okay, so um, we've, there's basically two options, are right? So continue to your dynamics or bladder augment and sling, right? If you just do a bladder augment, you know she has stress incontinence and she's gonna leak, but now she's gonna leak out mucus and urine um, and she's probably not gonna be happy with you with that. So why do we say continue your dynamics? Well, we don't really know what her compliance is yet. So maybe her bladder isn't that bad um, and you just, her outlet is so bad that she's leaking. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a Foley in and we're gonna obstruct her outlet. So it's really hard to assess a patient's compliance if their, um, if their detrusor leak point pressure is so low um, that the urine, the fluid that you put in just comes flying out um, because you, you can't really fill the bladder. And as it turns out, we obstructed her outlet here and there's what her pressure is doing. Um, so that's a problem, but this is, you really have to, for some patients, if their outlet's bad and you really wanna assess what's going on with their bladder, you really have to obstruct that outlet because you'd hate to do a bladder augment on someone who actually had a decent bladder because um, that adds a whole lot of complication risk, a whole lot of long-term management issues for a patient that just needs their outlet fixed. So this lady definitely needed the bladder augment and the sling, um, but she might not have. We weren't 100% sure. This is, I'm not sure here what's going on. Probably your pressure is already getting bad, um, but you really want to be sure that you, um, you prove that so that um, you're doing the right thing for the patient. So yes, failure to store, failure to empty. So her failure to store is due to her bladder. Um, her failure to store is also due to the outlet, right? And her failure to empty due to the bladder she can't void, um, she catheterizes. <clears throat> All right, here's one of my other favorite cases. My residents have probably heard this one, but um, this is a patient, this is a true story, it was referred to me um, for a completion of vasectomy, um, which is, you know, a standard referral. Um, so we had a unilateral vasectomy for um, orchitis, unilateral orchitis. He's a 6C4 spinal cord patient. Um, has complaints of sweating, headaches, lower extremity spasticity. He reflex voids into a diaper. Um, he actually has no medications except for a daily suppository. Okay, so this is his true tracing. Um, and so he um, actually refused a rectal catheter because of hemorrhoid problems. Problem, excuse me. So um, we, we let him slide on that one. Um, but um, so we were in the room and we start filling him and you see, and then pro I promised you he wasn't coughing and straining and it's very hard for a C4 spinal cord patient to generate that much abdominal pressure anyways. So it's this big contraction here. And what's this? This is the EMG. So this is the external sphincter um, going crazy as the detrusor contraction goes up. Um, you also see a little bit of leak here, a little bit of leak here. And this is at really low volumes and you slow down the fill and you say, okay, let's try it again. You slow it down to like five ml per minute and boom, it happens again at about, uh, about you know, 80 mls fill. Um, so, and this is what the picture looks like. And um, I wish it was a little clearer, but if you notice, this is his bladder. This 
is his prosthetic urethra. And if, if you've ever seen a voiding study, you know that a man's urethra is not supposed to look like a balloon right there. And then it kind of stops right there. And then you can kind of subtly see this stuff going here. So what's happening is he's reflexing into his ejaculatory ducts, uh, going all the way up to, into his seminal vesicles. So why is he getting repeated epididymorchitis? Um, you gotta wonder. There's just another picture a little bit later where you can still see that filling uh, going on. So failure to store, failure to empty bladder or outlet. We'll go through that again. So failure to store, yes, due to the bladder and the outlet, both, right? The bladder is having these huge high pressure contractions um, <clears throat> and um, his outlet, um, well, not really due to the outlet. Sorry, that's wrong. Take that off there, sorry. Um, and his failure to empty is due to his bladder and outlet. He, outlet. he can't volitionally void, so he's, he has failure to empty due to that. But he also, when he does have a contraction, he has dyssynergia, so that's a pretty bad um, external sphincter dyssynergia going on. And are we worried about his kidneys? Well, you can see by the unhappy kidney picture, you know, absolutely. So what are his treatment options? This is question four. And I think we're almost out of time, which is perfect. Yes, we are. <clears throat> It can be more than one option. Okay, so we're going to start with number two, but one, two, three, and four are all good options. Uh, completion vasectomy is probably not the right option. It might stop him from getting um, or chitis, maybe, but he's still going to get infections and have all the pressure problems that we saw. You know, external sphincterotomies sometimes are a good option for patients. This patient doesn't follow up, like doesn't, um, you think isn't going to come back and follow up, and you don't want to augment the patient. You don't want to give him Botox because he's got to come back for that over and over again. Maybe. Um, it's hard with external sphincterotomies because it's irreversible. Um, and the other thing we know is that um, you have to really monitor these patients with your dynamics because um, over time, um, it may be less effective and they may uh, develop high outlet resistance again. Um, <clears throat> okay, we should have a me. I'm kidding, I didn't do that. Um, we actually, um, we put him on meds. Um, and, and then just the other thing you think about, so he has headaches and flushing, which you noted before. Um, this happens um, during the study as well. So why does this happen? Um, the room's too hot. Um, his injury below T6, stimulation below T6, stim stimulation below above T6, residual effects of spinal shock, um, or the patient really didn't like me. Could be, I don't know. I think this is a poll question. So the answer is stimulation below T6, right? Um, <clears throat> so autonomic hyperreflexia, um, why does it happen? It's something you have to know if you're gonna be doing your dynamics on these patients. Um, these are the etiologies of it, but most commonly it's from bladder, um, honestly, sometimes from, from the rectum, but most commonly from the bladder and obstructed tube, uh, needs to catheterize, that sort of thing. It's an emergency um, for lesions above, for T6 and above, um, <clears throat> and um, it's an exaggerated, uh, basically sympathetic outflow uh, for stimulation below the level of the lesion. And this is life-threatening. Um, these patients can, uh, pressures can go very high on the 200 range, 250, they get reflex bradycardia. Um, most of them have um, a, a sensation when this is gonna start, and so it's good to be there talking to them. If you're worried about this, you really should monitor their blood pressure during your dynamics, and also have, we have um, nitro paste um, to manage this, because you can bring down the pressure pretty quickly, wipe it on, wipe it off. If you give them something that's longer, at, lack, as, longer lasting, you can really bottom out their blood pressure. Okay, so he ended up getting um, anticholinergics, and this is actually as true to life as follow-up tracing. I am not making this up. Um, again, he refused the rectal catheter, but his pressure stayed nice and low. This is furiously high, but this is, you can see it's a nice flat tracing, um, and he was a lot better. So I think we'll stop there. Um, um, the, I'll leave these on the slides. You can take a look at these other cases, um, but um, I'm gonna stop for some questions, but just remember, your dynamics, have a question in mind when you're doing them, make sure it's something that's going to change your management. It is an interactive test um, and um, you can't read the tracings without context. Um, can be a helpful adjunct, it's not always necessary. 
but make sure that in your neurogenic population, um, it's important for their kidneys. Kidneys are very valuable. The wait list for cadaveric kidneys is around 10 years, I think now. Um, so it's very, very important that you do that. And then I'm happy to take any questions. And these are my wonderful resident core. I don't know how they have time to go boating on Lake Michigan, but apparently they do. All right, uh, Michelle, questions? All right, yeah, thank you, Dr. Dr. Kielb for that uh, excellent lecture on neurodynamics. So one question is, what is your practice in terms of, you know, performing the neurodynamics yourself? Do you have well-trained staff that do it? Do you just participate in certain cases um, that you find more challenging? You know, what is your practice? So I, I usually have them scheduled throughout my clinic day. So um, typically we'll do, particularly my neuro days, it'll be about five in a full clinic day. Um, just because it's very time consuming getting particularly cervical patients on and off. Um, I have a nurse that her whole role is to do your dynamics and um, an LPN and she does not only your dynamics for me but for the, my partners, Dr. Hofer. Um, and so typically she'll tell me when she's ready to go um, and I will look at, she'll tell me what's going on with the patient. She's um, learned a lot in the few years she's been with me um, and she'll kind of um, tell me what's going on. She's telling me to start filling um, and then I'll kind of sneak in there at a certain time when I think um, I need to be there for the important parts of the study. If she sees something going on, she'll stop filling and come get me. Um, I do like to be in there for a lot of the important part of the study. So if the patient has a three, 400 cc bladder capacity, I'm not gonna stand there while they're filling up. Um, I'll go see a couple other patients and then I'll kind of pop in there. Um, and she'll let me know. Sometimes, um, you know, she's gotten pretty good and can um, do a lot of the, the cough stress testing and things like that. Um, and then I may go in and look at the tracings and we may slow down fill or change things. But typically it's, it's a team effort, definitely. Um, but having a good nurse that um, is familiar with it, knows the warning signs of, you know, the autonomic hyperreflexia um, and understands the question you're looking for, because it makes a big difference how you do the study, depending on what the indication for a, a C4 spinal cord patient is not the same as a 60 year old woman with prolapse. It's not the same study. Um, for fill rates and all those sorts of things. So yeah, I, I do it during my, my clinic. It's very inefficient to have a whole day of just your dynamics procedures. You're sitting around most of the time because a lot of it's set up and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then I talk to the patients right away. I don't make them come back to interpret the study. Um, I, I don't have the time for that nor do patients. And so I just like to interpret them right there, talk with the patients and then make a game plan from there. All right, and in terms of troubleshooting some issues during the study, um, how physiologic, one of the questions is, how physiologic do you find it when a patient is voiding around a catheter um, at the end of the study? And what if there are issues with the patient voiding? Yeah, that's always a tough one. I mean, it depends. I mean, you know, think about it. The catheters are set in French, and a lot of times people think, oh, it's going to obstruct me completely. Um, and all of us who've, you know, put a 30, 32 catheter three-way in a patient know that their urethra actually can accommodate um, a larger size and they can pee right around it. It's always difficult when you've got a patient that just can't urinate. Um, sometimes you just have to end the study because you're, and you're not getting the information that you want. Um, sometimes you can have them do a non-invasive uro flow. Um, we could take the catheter out, um, step out of the room. Um, sometimes that helps. Um, sometimes we'll pull the curtain and if I really want to get a fluoro shot, for instance, I'll step behind the curtain and you know, we'll try and like be quiet and see if we, and we'll run the water. Um, we'll give the patient something to drink. Um, sometimes if you really want that voiding phase, you just have to be patient. But a, a lot of patients can pee um, around, I mean, they should be able to physiologically pee around the catheter. Um, and you know, the measurements for pressure flow are all obviously based from uh, studies of patients with catheters in, right? I mean, there are um, people working on like sort of um, pressure transducers you can just put into the bladder that there's no catheter attached and, and ambulatory urodynamics and things like that, um, but those aren't certainly um, in prime time quite yet. And then during when you're performing urodynamics in a patient with prolapse, what is your preferred method and timing of reducing the prolapse? So we'll, um, we'll reduce it um, um, at the beginning of the study. Um, usually we'll use, if the patient's using a pessary, you can use that, though sometimes the pessaries themselves, if you, especially if you've got a, one that has an incontinence knob on it, as well as support pessary, you know, that may cause some, um, a bit of, of uh, obstruction problem. It shouldn't if they're peeing with it in. Um, so we usually, if they don't have a pessary, we'll just use, we'll use gauze and make sure that the prolapse is is fully reduced um, at the beginning of the study. I don't do it like three days before or anything like that. 
generally you don't need to. I mean, if, if they've got, you know, this is an anatomic issue with stress incontinence. And so, I mean, if they have that hypermobility and you push that bladder back up, um, it's generally speaking, you know, usually fairly obvious that they have stress incontinence, which is really the main thing you, you're going to, you want to answer with, with the urodynamics for that reason. Um, and a couple of questions were involving, you know, defining certain numbers and values, which is always a little bit tricky. Um, but one of them was, you know, what do you define as urinary retention um, on urodynamics? And is that different for men and women? Well, I mean, in my mind, you know, I mean, there's a difference between incomplete emptying and urinary retention, right? To me, urinary retention means they can't pee at all. So I don't think, you know, and if that happens only during your dynamics, they don't have urinary retention. They just are at a study that's really uncomfortable and they can't pee. So I really try to base those, even residual urines and, and that sort of thing on what happens when they come into clinic, for instance. So they come in, they, they were in your clinic, they peed on the way in, well, let's ultrasound their bladder right there and see what their, their real residual urine is. Um, because your dynamics, it's a false setting. So um, it's, it's very hard for a lot of people to pee. Um, you know, like I said, urinary retention to me means they can't pee at all. Um, and so there's really not a, I mean, basically they pee, if they can't pee at all, they can't pee at all. There's, there's no um, in between on that one, the way I think about it. If you talk about residual, you know, what's a bad residual? And we can have a whole lecture on, on that topic. But um, if the pressures are low and elevated residual, right, isn't going to hurt your kidneys. Um, unless it's, you know, it's, it's so bad that you've got two liters in your bladder and you have hydro. Um, but there's plenty of like the MS population um, out there that have three, 400 left over in their bladder every time they void and they're fine. Um, and so I leave them alone. If, you know, if they're, if they're filling pressures are fine and they're not having any problems, the last thing I would want to do is put a patient like that on catheterization and then introduce an infection problem where they don't have one. Right. And I think a good resource for that, there's the AUA white paper on chronic urinary retention that, that discusses a lot of that. Right can be found on the AUA website. AUANet.org. Yep. And then some questions, um, you know, is there a detrusor pressure during voiding of, to which you're concerned when you're assessing for, you know, obstruction? Is there a cutoff that you're looking for? So it depends if we're talking about, you know, men and women, um, and we're talking about, um, you know, there, what you want to look at is their detrusor pressure kind of at peak flow. Um, that tends to be the most accurate. Um, you know, for men, we said, you know, what the voiding pressures were. Um, there's not a true number where you'd say, oh, this patient definitely has to have an outlet procedure, for instance. Um, really what you're doing with the aerodynamics is saying, okay, they have a high voiding pressure. Um, and um, we're going to treat that outlet resistance. Now, the thing to know about, too, is that you may find sometimes patients with BPH, for instance, can have poor compliance um, and um, some uninhibited contractions. And why is that? Well, the bladder structurally changes, too, if you've got chronic obstruction. So you get, you get collagen deposition, you get thickened walls. If you think about it, if you've you know, obviously seen done TERPs on patients, their bladders can change, too. Um, and so you worry about that, but if you um, relieve their outlet, like those patients in general aren't blowing out their kidneys, uh, for instance. Um, but you know, you, you kind of look at your pressure versus the flow um, to determine is there outlet resistance or not. Most of the time for like a BPH patient, you're gonna do a urodynamics if you're thinking about doing an outlet procedure, if you're not sure. Um, one of the slides I have is a, a BPH patient was like one of the next cases. Um, who also has Parkinson's and a lot of irritative symptoms, a lot of obstructive symptoms. It's tough to know what's going on with those patients. I find them challenging um, because they have a lot of symptoms related to the Parkinson's, but they can also, they're also, you know, can be a 70 year old man with an enlarged prostate. So you really want to see, is there obstruction? And sometimes that's where the fluoro helps you um, in a, like a Parkinson's patient or your urethral pressure um, because they can have a um, bradykinetic external sphincter uh, which can look like outlet resistance, um, but if on your imaging, um, you just, you don't see the bladder neck opening at all, it's much more definitive that there's a prostate issue. Um, and it used to be taught that you shouldn't, you know, turt prostate uh, men with uh, uh, Parkinson's, but that's actually not the case. Some of the earlier studies mixed in some other uh, patients with different um, neurologic um, conditions, they all kind of got lumped together. Um, and, you know, if you have an obstructed 
Parkinson's man um, and he needs an outlet procedure, needs an outlet procedure, he may be at a little higher risk for incontinence. And so that's something you have to counsel people about because they have a lot of uninhibited contractions. Now they're going to leak easier. So it's something to be very careful to counsel patients about before considering it um, in that situation. Okay, I don't know if we have time for one more question or not. Looks like Let's we have go. one minute. One minute. Maybe a real quick question. One was just um, a simple question regarding Euroflow studies. You'd mentioned, yeah, that 150 mLs is usually the standard um, volume voided. One participant just wanted to know, is that 150 um, mL for voided volume only, or is it also voided volume plus their PVR? And is that 150 for both men and women? So, I mean, in general, most of the Euroflows you're going to do on men, right? So, I mean, women much less frequently have an outlet issue, unless you're talking about a sling. But um, so it's mainly for men. I mean, typically that's, you know, the voided volume that you want to see is, is at least 150. Um, but, you know, if, if you scan their bladder and there's 350 left in there and they can't get anything else out, then you also have a retention problem going on. So for the flow curve to be really something you can interpret, um, you want the volume to be about 150. Less than that, then you've probably got, if they've got a lot, a lot, lot in their bladder, then you've got a much higher degree of, of retention and the flow is actually kind of less important because you know it's not all coming out um, sort of thing. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Kiob, um, for a great lecture today. Um, we do have some additional questions that were asked, um, and I believe those will be posted on the website later. Um, and for all the attendees, if you could um, log on to the COVID website and just um, evaluate the lecture today and any of the lectures that you've listened to, and uh, we would really appreciate it. And then the other thing I forgot to say is I don't have any disclosures. <laughs> so no disclosures at the beginning. Um, but um, yeah, please uh, fill out the surveys. Um, it's very helpful for us for um, planning the lectures and, and making this a, a valuable tool for everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you.